Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Todd Montgomery. I'm the outreach manager here at the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee. And we are so excited to be celebrating World Elephant Day. We have a series of virtual visits from distinguished guests all around the world. And I'm absolutely honored to be joined now by author Carol Bradley. Uh, you guys are probably most familiar with Carol as the author of Last Chain on Billy, How One Extraordinary Elephant Escaped the Big Top, which is available at our Elephant Sanctuary gift shop at www.elephants.com. Carol, how are you? I'm great, thanks, Todd. Um, so, it's a beautiful day in Montana, and I can't complain. Fantastic. And I, I gave you a little bit of an introduction, but would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and who you are and what you've done? Sure. Um, well, I'm a native Tennessean. I grew up in East Tennessee, and I was a newspaper reporter for about 26 years, uh, working in Knoxville and Nashville and New York and, uh, and Washington, D.C., before moving out to Montana gosh, almost 26 years ago, um, I became interested in animal welfare after covering uh, an egregious puppy mill situation in Montana. And, and after I left newspapers, of, oh gosh, about 17 years ago, that was the first book I wrote. Um, and the book about Billy is my second book. Well, and that's, that's a perfect segue into the, the next question. Who is Billy? What, what, what do you think when, uh, when I say that name? Billy is a former circus elephant who I think symbolizes uh, a lot of the trauma and abuse that captive elephants undergo. Um, she, she actually had more trauma than most elephants. She's a highly sensitive, very intelligent elephant. All elephants are smart, but Billy just seems to have an extra edge. And um, she, I, when I first started working on the book, uh, Scott Blaze told me Billy is the elephant who reminds us every day what circus elephants go through. Excellent. And again, just to, to recap, I guess some of the broad strokes for, for folks that maybe haven't read your book yet. I'll, I'll give it that pre preface, right? Billy was uh, an Asian elephant, is an Asian elephant that was born in the wild imported like so many other elephant calves to the United States. She was in a, a zoo for a short spell. Then she went on to be what, you know, what we would refer to as a, a performing elephant or a circus elephant for, for several decades. And as you said, she endured a, a lot, uh, certainly a, a lot of um, uh, sort of harsh living conditions that go along with that, with that lifestyle, I suppose. And I guess my, my next question, Carol, is during your, what must have been extensive research for, for this book, um, what surprised you the most? What, you know, in, in kind of going through, learning about Billy's life, researching the lives of all these circus elephants, was there anything that, that, you know, truly, truly surprised you or you thought, well, this can't, this, this can't be real. Like there's, there must be more to it. Well, I sort of knew that already when I started my research that the federal government does a pretty lousy job of keeping track of captive wild an animals in this country. Uh, they sort of turn the, the, the other cheek. Uh, they, don't, they don't clap down on circuses and, and zoos even uh, that are doing a bad job of taking care of their animals. But it surprised me how, how bad a situation could get and can get in the circuses that remain uh, with elephants like Billy. Uh, it, it, it just seemed like no one was looking out for them except animal welfare groups who were trying their darnest to rein in the treatment of these animals. Uh, that surprised me. And just realizing how remarkably intelligent animals are, elephants are, and how they really don't forget. You know, there's the old saying, elephants don't forget. They don't. And in the early days of circuses and traveling menageries, there were a lot of, quote, killer elephants, mm -hmm. um, elephants who would remember who had abused them and you know, would bide their time. And when the chance came, they would lash out in mm -hmm. return and often kill their handlers. Um, the town I grew up in, Kingsport, Tennessee, uh, is where an elephant in 1916 lashed out at her handler and killed him when he poked her too hard with a bullhook. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And um, my grandmother was a teenager at the time. She saw this elephant pick this handler up and toss him into a wooden Coca-Cola stand mm -hmm. and then stomp him to death. And that elephant, whose name was Mary, was hanged the next day in Irwin, Tennessee. And poor Irwin has, has dealt with the reputation ever since as being the town that hanged an elephant. But in reality, many killer elephants were, were tortured to death in their day. So it's not a pretty history of elephants in this country. And I, I want to add two things to that. Uh, one, you mentioned the, the bull hook, and for people that may not be aware, uh, that's a, a tool that has been used for, or various versions of it have been used for uh, millennia, probably, for working with elephants. And of course, depending, it's typically it's a, a staff with a, a metal hook or prong on the end of it. And as you can imagine, it's used to, to push, pull, prod, guide, depending um, on, you know, on the person who's holding it. And in some cases, it can be certainly a tool of pretty, uh, pretty outrageous abuse, as you described. I, I do have to say, and um, I, I hope that they hear this, the town of Irwin, Tennessee is very near and dear to my heart, uh, because yes. as this small town that has lived with a century as being known as the town that hung an elephant, that's, that's, that's a tough mantle to, to have around one's neck. But uh, this town of Irwin now has created a, a yearly series of events to honor the memory of Mary the Elephant. And so now all these years later, um, they've, they've done a lot of work. They've actually raised funds for the Elephant Sanctuary to help us care for, for captive elephants in our care. So um, fascinating place, wonderful people that are certainly, certainly have um, done right by Mary. Maybe that's absolutely, that's absolutely. Jamie Rice gets a big shout out for me. <laughs> I, for I talked to her two days ago. Okay, she's she invited me to talk there several years ago, mm -hmm. and you know, Irwin decided to take their reputation and try to make some good out of it, and they've really done a great job. So, thumbs up to Irwin. Absolutely. Um, so back back to Billy. As much as I'd love to talk about Irwin for for the rest of the day, um, and I, I don't, I hate to get too much in the weeds about this because it is it's not exactly uplifting. But as you said, this is a very a very special elephant that that went through a lot of um, unpleasant experiences, to put it very, very uh, mildly. Could you give us one or two examples from your research of some of the um, cruelties maybe that, that Billy had to endure during her life as a, as a performing elephant? Sure. Well, Billy was born in 1962. She was brought to America in 1966. So she was just four years old. She was really a baby. And, you know, we now know that elephant young elephants will stay with their mothers, their sisters, their aunts. If they're female, they'll stay with that herd their entire lives. And so to wrench a young elephant away from its mother, there's no telling what trauma the mother went through and the, the extended family went through. And, and in some cases, mother elephants were killed so babies could be captured. Uh, but she was brought over here and she started off here living in a zoo in Massachusetts. And at that time, her name was Popsicle. Um, she spent a little bit of that time with another elephant, but most of her years there, she, she was there for six years. Most of her time there, she was by herself in a small corral. Um, and a trainer came up from Rhode Island to teach her a few basic tricks, and she would give children rides. But she was living alone and in a very unnatural life. And um, when she was about 10 years old, a man in Chicago, John Cuneo, he was a millionaire, and he had kind of a traveling troop of wild an animals. And he had heard he needed to replace one of the elephants in his troop that he would lease out to cir circuses. And he had heard that this zoo had a smart elephant and popsicle. So he hired a trainer in Florida named Buckles Woodcock, and I'm not making that up, yeah. <laughs> to, go to, to go to Massachusetts, purchase Popsicle, bring her to Florida, and train her quickly enough that John Cuneo could add her to his group. He had a group called the Hawthorne Five, and they were five elephants who performed a lot of pretty incredible tricks given the size of elephants. So Buckles Woodcock did, he, go, he brought uh, Popsicle back to his place and 
she immediately was a little defiant. She had never had to go through what he was about to put her through. And Buckles had a habit of <clears throat> anytime he encountered a difficult, difficult elephant, he would rename them after one of his sisters-in-law. And so he renamed Popsicle Billy, and that's how she got that name. And within six weeks, he had her trained well enough to join the circus. He used some electrical hot shots with her, a lot of beatings. Um, you know, when you have an elephant the size that an elephant is, even a young elephant, it's not a natural thing for an elephant to walk alongside a human being or to capitulate to what a human being wants it to do. There's such a difference in size. And these are wild animals we're talking about. So typically elephants as babies are beaten so severely that they learn to submit themselves to human beings. And even as they grow to be mammoth sized, they never, why get out of that philosophy, that feeling that the human holding that bull hook, that weapon, is really the one in charge. So, um, yeah, Billy went through a lot, and and um, she actually learned. She was quite adept at performing tricks. She could stand on her hind feet, which is a really remarkable feat for you know an, an animal that weighs several tons. Mm -hmm. Um, she could balance on a drum. Um, she could she could walk on her hind leg. She and, and um, she just had a lot of tricks in her arsenal. But she was never happy about it. And she gained a reputation over the years as a difficult elephant. And so trainers might come in in the morning. They would greet the other elephants, and they would just smack Billy on the face. Uh, so she just never, never settled into that lifestyle. Uh, she was just, she never, she never killed anyone like some elephants did, but she, you know, she nursed a grudge mm -hmm. and deservedly so. Right. And when we say, when you say a, a difficult elephant, that also of course means a very, a very dangerous elephant. That's something that of course that we talk about a lot is how it, how incredibly intelligent these animals are, how they have these incredible memories and they do seem to possess some range of or scope of feelings and emotions. And so all that creates a, a, a highly complex individual and every elephant is, is um, unique, obviously, of course, and Billy, a product of her, of her circumstances, just like, um, just like so many others. Um, was there any particular part of Billy's story over the course of your, of your research? Was there anything that really, that really, sort of resonated with you? Uh, any, any particular piece that really maybe told you that you were, or made you feel like you were on the right path or doing the right thing, or really um, put an exclamation point on the fact that this is a story that, that needed to be told? Well, I knew from writing my first book um, that when you're, when you're writing about animal welfare, it's such an emotional issue and you need to have a happy ending, mm -hmm. if at all possible. You know. It, Readers, and, and, and I include myself in this, don't want to read a 300 page book and get to the end and everything is, remains gloom and doom. Right. So when I decided to write about a circus elephant, I wanted to find an elephant that had survived the circus and was now leading a much better life. And the best place to find that was at the elephant sanctuary. Um, and the sanctuary has such a great website with the stories of all the elephants there. Um, <clears throat> my, initially, I, I, I sort of picked out an elephant I thought would make a good story. Her name was Frida. Mm -hmm. And I called Scott Blaze, who was still at the sanctuary at the time, he was a co-founder, mm -hmm. asked if I could come down. I was, I was gonna be in Nashville anyway. And he welcomed me down and I said, I just wanna talk about what you do and explain that I was interested in writing a book and had even picked out the elephant I thought would make a good story. Um, and Scott said, you know, all of the elephants here are deserving of having their story told. But he said, if I were to write a book, I would pick Billy. Well, why? And he said, because, as I said, Billy reminds us every day what circus elephants go through. She's still, she still suffers a range of emotions 
Uh, now this was in, boy, when was it? 2010, uh -huh. um, when I first began working on that book. So it's been a decade ago. Um, but I thought, hey, this, this guy is around these elephants every day. He knows their personalities well. Uh, I, you know, I think it would be uh, in my good stead to take his advice and focus on Billy. And, you know, I think he was right. She, her story really did tell the story of all circus elephants. And, you know, she, she was one of eight elephants well, John Cuneo had to give up all of his elephants at one point. He had 16 of them. And eight of those elephants wound up at the sanctuary. Billy was one of the last two elephants. I think Frida was her, was her friend. And, and the two of them were the last two to be brought down from Illinois to Hohenwald. And this was in, because they, they, this was in 2006, I guess we should say, just to yes. give scale. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it took a long time to, uh, before the, you know, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, lowered the boom on John Cuneo and made him give up his elephants, but it was the largest relinquishment of circus elephants in U.S. history, so that also caught my eye. Sure. And um, so much preparation went into bringing these elephants, what they would not realize, but the sanctuary realized would be their last journey mm -hmm. in a truck and or a trailer, and, and in this case, they had very comfy accommodations, but they still worried that Billy might just throw a complete fit. And, and really to everyone's surprise, she, she followed along obediently. She did not freak out. And so her new life at the sanctuary began. And I, I realized I should have said this at the beginning, but I'll say it now again for people who aren't familiar with Billy. I should be very clear in saying that Billy is alive and well. It's, it's 2020. Billy is with us. She's doing great. And so when we talk about the sanctuary being um, sometimes it's tempting to use the phrase happy ending, but really it's, we're, we're still kind of in the happy, maybe the happy middle for Billy. You know, she's still, right. she's still doing well. And uh, we're very, very hopeful that her life at the sanctuary will continue for a, a good long while and she will continue. To, to grow and, and to settle in. But I am curious, Carol, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you recall Billy's first days at the sanctuary life? Like she, she stepped off of that truck. She's now a, a member of the, of the sanctuary herd. What, was, what were those first days and, and weeks like that, that you recall? Well, none of these elephants that came down as part of this <laughs> uh, group, this, these eight elephants, had, had really lived the, the natural life of an elephant. If they had, it was early in their, their youngest years. So they were never out in a field left to behave naturally. They were kept tied up, chained up in a barn, you know, a cold barn, an, an uninsulated barn. They got no exercise. They did not really know how to interact with one another. And so to suddenly be in what was almost like a Shangri-La for them. Here they were with grass and trees and sand and ponds that they could take a bath in, which elephants love to do. That did not happen as naturally or as quickly as I think anyone expected. And Billy was especially apprehensive. That was just her personality. Um, some of the elf, other elephants sort of quickly became acclimated to this new wonderful life that they had been given. But Billy was really uh, a nervous animal. She was afraid. She was especially afraid of an elephant named Minnie, who was assertive, aggressive, kind of wanted, kind of a, wanted to play, but in a bullying sort of way. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, Billy would wander up into the trees above the barn and she would just stand in the trees all day and look down and watch the other elephants but she really wasn't part of that group and so that kind of broke my heart too mm -hmm. um, you don't think of an elephant having those kinds of emotions but she did well and again i think that speaks to the to their complexity and their intelligence as you said before that you know, even within that, that smaller group of eight elephants that came, they were all very, very different from one another in terms of their experience, their personalities, and how they reacted to this new 
of sanctuary, new sanctuary home. Um, and I know that, you know, sometimes people, uh, I think most people understand now why sure. they can pay $10 and drive through the sanctuary and, you know, come within 20 feet right. of an elephant. But I was really struck my first visit to the sanctuary uh, when it was explained to me that even when an unfamiliar person mm -hmm. stands in the doorway of a barn and an elephant sees that person, they tend to stiffen up because mm -hmm. in their track record, someone they didn't know was sure. probably a new groom who was going to acquaint himself with the elephant by beating the tar out of him. Mm -hmm. And so they just had this innate distrust of any human they didn't know. Certainly. Well, and I, I we use Billy as an example a lot because we say, you know, I, I really believe that if Billy, if Billy had her way, if she could talk, she would probably be more than happy to, to never come in contact with another human. I mean, I, I really think she's one of those elephants that's like, y'all, I'm over here. Like, it's, I, think, I think she has come a long way in being patient with her care staff and giving them uh, the benefit of the doubt when if you know, obviously given everything that she's been through I think that's remarkable in and of itself but I think Billy is is certainly an example of an elephant who is I think happy at least to the extent that that an elephant like Billy can be to, to not have crowds of people around I think that's definitely a good good thing for for her um, and yet she has the capacity she's shown the capacity in the in the ensuing years of exhibiting complete happiness, mm -hmm. you know, just maybe for a few moments at sure. a time, but just to trumpet and joy, uh, right. to see her friends, the friends that she's had come out of the barn and mm -hmm. reunite with her, even if they were only apart for 15 or 20 minutes. Right. Uh, I think has been really heartening for the sanctuary staff to see. Um, and, and, from the sounds of it, she has come a long way in the last decade. Yeah, even like I said, even even, even this year, you know, we're seeing her. Um, gosh, and I don't. I, I we always say that we we can't we can't read the elephant's mind. And I certainly can't tell you what what Billy's thinking or what she's feeling. But based on our observations, it seems like some of that old anxiety or fear. Like I, I really think that has ebbed away over the course of the years. And I think now maybe she, I, I hope, I'll put it to you that way, I hope that she understands that nothing bad is going to happen to her here in, intentionally. That's, I think that's sort of our, our desire. So um, yeah. I wonder if you could speak about, we, we talk a lot about, and if people watch our videos on YouTube, they've probably seen um, The Chain. Of course, that's the title of your book, Last Chain on Billy. So what was the significance of that, that last chain? Well, Billy um, arrived she was the only elephant of the eight who came from John Cuneo to the sanctuary. She was the only one who still had a chain around her, her one of her legs. Mm -hmm. She was too nervous and too unpredictable for anyone to be able to get that, that chain off. And so the sanctuary staff, you know, quickly learned that they could tell if Billy was nearby I and mean, she would just have this, ankle bracelet basically mm. that was jingling whenever she would come or go and it was it was a sad reminder of the life she had lived and you know I know that some of the staff felt felt as though Billy it maybe didn't symbolize anything to her it, it had been on her leg for so long but it sure was a reminder to the to the humans around her what she had been through and so it was sort of a goal of the sanctuary, you know, to someday get Billy in a good enough place that that chain could come off. And I would say part of that process, and again, to, to speak to Billy's incredible patience and bravery is using our protective contact management system, whereas there's always a protective barrier in between humans and elephants. That means that Billy the elephant had to voluntarily walk over to that barrier and put herself in closer proximity to humans and place some element of, of trust in the humans working here that, again, nothing, nothing bad was going to happen. And so to establish that relationship using uh, positive reinforcement, using rewards, using affirmations, uh, to go through that process and have Billy respond in the way that she did, to your point, Carol, um, 
it was certainly a big deal for for the staff and our our goals and our mission here. And of course, I you know we'd all like to think it was a big deal for for Billy as well to finally be rid of that be rid of that silly chain. And I should say that you guys can see uh, the video, the actual video of Billy's chain being removed at our our YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube, just type in the Elephant Sanctuary, and we'll we'll pop right up there. So Carol, to go back to your book, last chain on Billy. Um, what is something that you hope readers take away from the book? If, if someone completes the book, what do you, what would you like their, um, well, maybe their, their take action steps to be? Well, um, I've had people say to me, I cannot, you know, I've read your book and I can't believe the elephants are still performing in circuses. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, Ringling Brothers went out of business, mm -hmm. but there are still about two dozen smaller skanky circuses that roam around uh, and they come through this town every year mm -hmm. and um, these elephants lead a very sad unnatural life. Um, I, I was under the impression that maybe circuses perform for a couple of months a year mm -hmm. and the rest of the time the animals would be let out to pasture. No, they're on the road constantly and these elephants basically live in the back of a tractor trailer um, have very unfortunate lives they had to be abused to be taught the tricks that are very unnatural they suffer arthritis from standing on their hind legs um, and um, we now know that elephants can contract tuberculosis from human beings and they can transmit tuberculosis to human beings. So when I hear about someone's child riding an elephant, you know, I just wince. Yeah. Um, but I would like to see uh, all wild animals, really all animals, period, banned from performing in circuses. And there are municipalities in the country, and there are a couple of states that have said, you know, wild animals performances will not be allowed here. I'd like to see that become the norm. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just an archaic way of entertaining people. And, you know, kids don't know the difference. I went to right. the circus here to watch, to see what was going on. And I, it struck me that the young children in the audience were more interested in their glow wands and, you know, the, the popcorn, whatever had, sure. they had been bought for them. They weren't really watching the elephants. And, you know, circuses should be fun. And when you go to a circus where the humans are performing, they're doing the trapeze acts and, and all of that and the clowns, that's fun. It, circuses should also be fun for the people performing in them. Mm -hmm. And it's not true of the animals. So, so I just like to see that go away. So I, I guess to, not to put too bad of a point on it, but do you, think it's, do you think it's okay for elephants to be in circuses? Oh, no, I don't. Um, it's it's a cruel life that they lead and um, it's unhealthy. They're standing on concrete all the time. They develop arthritis. They have shortened lives because mm. of it. They endure a lot of beatings and um, it's, it's, it's very cruel. Um, it should be outlawed. Well, and all of this, of course, is detailed uh, in um, what is absolutely one of my favorite books. Again, it's Last Chain on Billy uh, by Carol Bradley, How One Extraordinary Elephant Escaped the Big, Dop, the Big Top. Um, Carol, is there anything you'd like to share with us about what you're, what you're working on now? Well, I'm still interested in animal welfare. I've got a couple of projects going on, but I guess the most timely one is um, I'm looking at the plight of captive tigers in America. And if anyone watched any or all of Tiger King, I I've heard um, of yeah, uh, Tiger King focused on the characters who run these roadside zoos. And I'm more interested in the lives and the rescue of the tigers that live at these roadside zoos. Absolutely. Well, we'll look forward to learning more about that. Um, I'm sure it will be at least as great as, as Last Chain on Billy, which is, is saying something incredible. Carol, thank you for spending this time with us. Happy World Elephant Day. You can learn more about Billy and all of the other elephants that are retired here at the Elephant Sanctuary at our 
website, which is www.elephants.com. And again, you can order your copy of Last Chain on Billy there as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.